November 17, 1986, Paris, France. Around 8 p.m. shots were heard in the Montparnasse district on the Edgar Cunet Boulevard. People looked out of the windows and saw several people running along the street, a stroller standing on the roadway and the man lying on the sidewalk. The victim had four gunshot wounds to the chest. Naturally, the police and journalists arrived quite quickly. Instantly, the empty street was filled with a large number of people and 20 minutes later, even the mayor of Paris arrived, who was then Jacques Chirac and who in the future would become the prime minister of France. He came because it was a serious incident. The killed man was the head of Renault company, George Bess, one of the most influential and famous executives in the country, but who took his position quite recently, only in January 1985, which means that he worked as a head for just less than two years. And here's the first question. Why did somebody want to kill the head of the car manufacturer? The national car corporation, not the private one. Who would be so bothered by a man from a company that makes cheap hatchbacks? that he would be killed in the middle of the prestigious area. But if everything would be so simple here, I wouldn't be telling you this story. So let's start digging a little deeper. At first glance, this crime may seem quite ordinary, but the more carefully you start looking at the details, the more questions arise. For example, despite the fact that George Bass was a quite prominent figure in the country, there is not much available information about him. He was born in Locksmith family in 1927, entered the engineering college, and after he studied at the Paris School of Mines. Most of his life he worked in mining enterprises as an engineer at first and then as executive. A bit remarkable was the fact that he was assistant general manager of CIT Alcatel, in 1954. Alcatel, as you remember, was the cell phone brand in the early 2000s, but with one small remark, that Alcatel is a giant corporation that produced entire telecommunication stuff for companies since 19th century. And at some point, just like Siemens, they began to produce everything they could think about. At some moment, they've been producing even trains. From 1964 to 1974, Bess was in the head management of Alcatel and worked on improving business, optimization, and other boring things. From 1974 to 1985, he worked as a general manager in mining sector, there is nothing interesting. And in 1985, he became the head of Renault. And in two years, he got killed. That's it. That's his whole biography. I'm not kidding. Okay, maybe some more information about his private life, but who killed him and why? Who was so much displeased with the manager of a national corporation? Not clear. But in a couple of days after the murder, there were many leaflets appeared all around Paris, and those leaflets said that responsibility for the murder was taken by some organization, Action Direct. But in French it would be more like Action Direct. Sorry, I don't speak French. Also, besides slogans, those leaflets said that Bass was killed for his crimes against the working class and for the exploitation of the same working class. But how this all is connected? I'll explain. Please welcome. Jean-Marc Ruyan, Georges Cipriani, Natalie Menigan, and Jules Apron. Whoa, my French is not so bad. These guys were ideological leaders of Axiom Direct, who technically were far-left anarchists, and who professed the theory of permanent revolution, which means that if there is any social ladder in which one person can dominate another one, then this is completely unacceptable which generally sounds quite fair because there is nothing good in capitalism. But the guys' methods were not the most humane. And as most often happens, technically covering with ideology slogans with quite vague statements, they threw bombs to international buildings, airports, attacked police departments and robbed banks. Sounds like a boring Tuesday in France. They had about 80 crimes for about 8 years to their name. 10 acts a year. Which means each month, during 8 years, those guys made a bustle somewhere. And in all this time, those guys were responsible for about 120 human victims, which is absolutely terrible. But something else is surprising in this story. The amazing thing is that they made 80 raids and were never caught. 
In this sense, they definitely were great professionals. As these guys wrote in their memoirs, training was mandatory for all members in the organization. It's something about 150-200 people in different time periods. Participants learn to shoot, run long distances and extreme driving at special training grounds. And the first question, how did they do all this not attracting the slightest attention? You cannot just go and, and what? Like rent a place for this kind of training? No, it wasn't possible to get any specific data, but in their memoirs, the letters wrote that they trained at night in fields, forests and some swamps. And for all this, they took the money from the loot. Sounds a little dubious for this level of professionalism. Most likely there was some serious level of support without which all this would not be possible. Because the members of the organization were more like well-trained militants than a crowd of careless students with romantic ideas, since it was simply impossible to catch them. And in the shootouts with the police, which occurred periodically, only policemen died, and there were practically no casualties among the organization's members, which also indicated a serious level of preparation. And it's unlikely possible that such training could be obtained simply by reading books and running through swamps and forests. But despite the fact that for eight years no one could catch them, after the murder of Bess, the entire top of the organization was immediately found and they surrendered without a fight. Indeed, they just sat down in the kitchen and didn't even resist. And this is another strange thing. For eight years they couldn't be caught and after this murder they practically gave up. Somehow the police found out that all four leaders of the group were at some farm in the suburbs of Paris. The police immediately arrived at the scene and made the arrest. And the detention itself was shown on all channels live from a helicopter. And then during investigative interrogations, it became clear exactly how the murder was committed. Two women, Natalie Manigan and Jules Abron, were walking down the street with baby strollers with guns inside. And Jean-Marc Ruyan and George Ciprani were waiting for them on motorcycles in the next block. And by the way, it was very tricky to hide a weapon inside a baby stroller. Naturally, the killers knew the schedule of the victim. They knew where he lives and what time he arrives. And although he was a high-ranking executive, he didn't have any security. And when the driver dropped him off at the address, two women approached him and shot him four times at a point-blank range. During interrogation, the killers did not deny anything. They admitted everything and continued to say that they were fighters against the rotten system. They did everything right and did not regret anything. And the guys got it in full. They were put in a prison with some kind of special security regime. Each received a sentence of more than 20 years or a life sentence. Each of them was kept on a separate floor in a small cell in complete isolation. Any slightest chance to communicate with anyone was just eliminated. Prison staff were also prohibited from communicating with prisoners. And this is also strange. Why was such a special kind of cruelty for these people? But anyway, it may seem that that's all. The crime was solved and the story of the Axiom Direct organization had been ended. And this is the explanation you would find on the internet. But despite the fact that everything seems quite logical, there are still two questions exist. Why was particularly George Bass killed? The operation was planned specifically against him. And the second question, why did such a powerful organization almost voluntarily cease to exit immediately after this murder? And to get this, we need to dive into the Renault history and understand what was happening then and what George Bass did during his two years of work at the company. Renault is a giant company and one of the largest experts in France. Traditionally, this brand has a reputation of low-budget urban hatchbacks producer. And probably starting from the 90s, Renault is trying with all its might to get rid of this legacy. After the Second World War, when Renault had come under the state control, this model was released, the 4CV. It was practically a copy of the Volkswagen Beetle, a simple, cheap and reliable car that was ideally suited to post-war requirements. Because half of Europe lies in ruins, and a cheap car is the only thing that people can afford although even such cars were difficult to sell at that time. Between 1947 and 1949, only 37,000 of these machines were sold. That's why the plant worked to further simplify and reduce the cost of the car. And when they managed to reduce the price by 20%, sales simply took off. The car remained on the assembly line until 1961 and during all this time, 1.1 million copies were sold. After this, a new model came out, Renault 4, which became Renault's first front-wheel drive car and was made on the principle that a car should be the same as jeans. It should be inexpensive, convenient and universal and should suit absolutely everyone. And we can say that jeans turned out to be good because the car had been assembling from 1961 to 1994, produced in 28 countries and sold all over the planet. And in 33 years, more than 8 million cars were sold, which makes Renault 4 
one of the most popular car in the world. In parallel, in the periods from 60s to 80s, other models were produced, such as Renault 16, Renault 5, which also sold millions in circulation. And naturally, as you might guess, the company was doing very well. You can have different opinions about the design of these cars. But thanks to them, Renault became a huge and rich company and started throwing money on right and left, creating their own racing teams in rally, in Formula 1, in order to dominate everywhere that is somehow related to cars. In each kind of racing, there was a different level of success. For example, for eight years in Formula 1, they just managed to take the second place among all racing teams only once, but they invested a huge amount of money. Why they needed this? This is a rather theoretical question. Because most automakers come to Autosport only to show that the company has developments, uh, various new technologies and so on. In general, they're just showing off. There is no practical sense in this, especially if you produce cheap hatchbacks. But this is a high quality PR of the brand. But honestly, there was a logic in Renault actions. This was done to implement one important project, namely entering the most important and profitable market, the United States one. Although in the 70s, a small hatchback is not at all what Americans would like to buy. At that time, the large cars with V8 under the hood were very popular in the United States. Therefore, naturally, sales of Renault cars in the USA was so tiny that it was a shame, especially comparing to the Volkswagen Beetle, which was sold in the US in its millions. But if you remember, in the 70s, the OPEC countries refused to supply oil to the United States and Western countries for a chip, which immediately caused the rise in prices and huge oil crisis. Fuel was not available everywhere and was very expensive. In Europe, people were even asked to heat their homes and use personal vehicles less than before. Nothing changed. And of course, in this situation, the demand for huge cars with large engines fell. And at the same time, Ford, GM and Chrysler, the big three, were unable to quickly offer suitable cars, which of course was successfully used by Volkswagen and Japanese manufacturers. So Renault naturally also wanted to participate in this and gain some market share. But their cars sold poorly. Some solution had to be found. And a solution was found. The French decided to buy a local company, which turned out to be the American Motor Company, or AMC. This was the fourth largest manufacturer of the big three, 4 GM and Chrysler, in the US. But the problem is that the company, the AMC, presented itself as an alliance of a large number of small companies. And this entire alliance did not have much success. Unlike Renault, the energy crisis hit American companies very hard. And while the government helped the big three with money, AMC received just nothing. The situation was terrible. AMC's market share was less than 2%. The company was unprofitable and even had debts. And Renault found such a partner. Renault had to invest more than $250 million to help new partner. And this is, by the way, did not guarantee any success. This is not counting all the problems that were within the French company. And in France itself, at that time, it wasn't so quiet as well. We have to admit that the French are quite peculiar people. Americans have American football, the Japanese have sushi, and the French people like to have a coffee with a croissant in the morning. And in the evening, go overturn cars, destroy stores, and overthrow the government along the way. Because there are no such number of street demonstrations with all the consequences anywhere else. And in the 60s, the situation was not much different. In the late 60s, there were protests in France that had never happened before, which resulted in a change of the government. Charles de Gaulle was then replaced by his good friend, George Pompidou. So we can say that the overthrow did not happen. And since the protest actually failed, many were left dissatisfied. And from these dissatisfied people, various organizations and groups began to form. And Exxon Direct arose exactly in the same way. And what happened next is a classic example of the capitalist system work. And this is in general a problem of all times. Of course, everyone understands that brigand ditches and murders are not a solution to the problem. But on the other hand, how then to convey your idea and reach the people making decisions? How can people say them? that the current system is unfair. Because the main disadvantage of the capitalist system is that those people who do the main work earn the less. The result of their work doesn't belong to them. They are simply paid a salary to don't die and be able to come to work tomorrow. Because in this wild system, in order to become a rich person, you basically need bad qualities. Because if you are a kind, smart and decent person, then most likely you will not be able to get rich. I don't want to say that everyone who got rich is a bad person. No, someone is just lucky. It's like a lottery. The only question is why do people need this lottery? Because now there is a very small number of rich people and a huge number of poor who work for these rich ones. But if income is distributed fairly, it will greatly improve the life of each individual person. This doesn't mean that everyone will immediately buy a Maybach. No, it just means that your income will most likely increase two, three or four times, depending on what your position is. 
and the lower your position is, the more times your income should be multiplied. And there is a good example with the food. Today so much food is produced that there would be enough for every person on our planet. But capitalism doesn't do charity. And it's much easier to destroy products than to give them away and lose the demand. The same thing happens with the cars in apartments. Huge numbers of cars and apartments that are destroyed because of the overproduction. Just think about it. Finished cars and apartments are destroyed all that they could be given to those in need. But a funny thing is to watch how ordinary people often defend the existing capitalist system. And they do this precisely because of the lottery existence. The lottery which is called the American Dream, which says that if you work hard, you will someday become a capitalist yourself. But this is a lie. Firstly, if you work well, then why capitalists should increase your salary? You're already doing a good job. And the less capitalist pays you, the more money he keeps for himself. And the most important thing is that people altogether cannot be capitalists at the same time. There should be someone working for them. So, unfortunately, while the American dream is working, people continue to fight with each other, although the enemy is on the other side. I don't want to say that I share the methods of the protesters, because I wouldn't want to go outside and see my car on fire, but I can just easily understand why this happens. But let's get back to our topic. So, we're in France in the mid-70s, where a large number of underground organizations that are fighting the existing regime begin to appear. And Action Direct, as an organization, appeared in the late 70s. And they were not only ones who began to attack government agencies or banks. In parallel with this, a fuel crisis occurs when APEC countries limited oil supplies to the United States and its Western allies. Prices in the USA and Europe are naturally rising, which entails layoffs and increased unemployment. And this only makes the situation in France even worse. And in 1979, as we remember, Renault was trying to get the AMC company out of its dead hole. Plus. Renault still has a bunch of expensive racing teams, and Renault is a huge company with thousands of employees. And such Titanics cannot just quickly turn around and easily adapt to the situation. All they can do well is drown. Obviously, the situation in the company worsened every year. And by 1985, Renault is experiencing a loss of 12 billion francs per year. It turns out that, due to a series of wrong decisions, the company turned from profitable to unprofitable in just a few years. So, to save the company, they decided to change management and appoint George Bass, who had previously managed the Pichny Eugene Kuhlman company, as director. And this is also another huge corporation in France, which employed more than 100,000 people in the 80s. Pichny Eugene Kuhlman was involved in the processing of raw materials from the mining sector and production of the thermal packaging. And once Bass became immersed in the company's affairs, he was naturally horrified by the inefficiency and began to clean up this mess. The first thing he did was immediately close all expenses on motorsports. Then right after that, he closed all not profitable production and reduced stuff. And usually when a large number of employees are laid off, negotiations with the trade unions take place. Because you cannot first use human labor for two cents and then throw people as a garbage. Workers should be protected. But Bess apparently decided that there was no need for this. Sure. Why bother with these workers at all? He simply fired 21,000 people and did not allow the press into the plant. Well, and it's clear that after such actions, of course, the company becomes profitable. But no matter how cruel Bess was towards workers, he did not deserve a death. No murder could be justified. Yes, we live in a capitalist system and it's an unjust system. But the murder is not acceptable. But the biggest problem is that all this is not the answer to the question why particularly him was killed. Why George Bess? At that time, workers were fired from almost all companies. And all these dismissals were also accompanied by demonstrations and strikes. But there were no murders. Only Bass was killed. And it looks like just a random murder. And like it's a dead end. But we know that Accident Direct killed more than 100 people. What if we look at victims and maybe we can connect these crimes? And the clue wasn't difficult to find. A little less than two months before the murder of George Bass, René Adran was killed in his home. And his death was also the work of Action Direct. If you look at what criminals wrote about this, you will see that they believed that René Adran deserved to die. René Adran was the chief engineer of the French Ministry of Defense, who was responsible for the supply of French weapons to other countries. And in particular, he controlled the supply of weapons to Iraq, which fought with Iran in the 80s. The war between Iraq and Iran was simply terrible, basically like any other war. It began in 1980, it lasted for 8 years, and during these 8 years, there was just so much. Carpet bombing, the use of chemical weapons, sending miners to the front, hunger, lack of medical care, and so on. There is no exact data on losses, but according to rough estimates, this is somewhere around 750,000 people killed and 1.5 million people wounded. And that was just recently. 
35, 40 years ago. And because René Adran was engaged in supplying weapons to Iraq, the guys from Axiom Direct killed him. But I have a question. Do you really care who is fighting there on the other side of the planet? Because the 80s are not like modern times. There were much less information available. All you have is newspapers and TV. And you cannot be sure how much you may trust these sources. Pretty much at the same time, there were many conflicts happening. There was war in Ethiopia, in Angola, in Sudan, coup in Turkey, the rebellion in Syria, the war in El Salvador, the war between the USSR and Afghanistan, the war in Lebanon, the Cold War between the USA and the USSR, the massacre on the Tiananmen Square in China, the conflict in Peru, the war in Nicaragua and several other conflicts. And in many of those, France took part with its influence and weapons. So why this particular war? And here we need to remember that during demonstrations in France in the 60s, there were demands that France had to leave its colonies. So let's rewind some time back. Sorry for interruption, guys, just some information which might be useful for you, by the way. Because if you are interested in financial markets and would like to get some knowledge, and I'm talking about the deep knowledge, about the understanding of all financial instruments, including difficult ones like futures or options, if you would like to know how to create your own portfolio and how to handle it, how to hedge it with other financial instruments, you can follow the link in the description below and get the thorough financial course on our Patreon channel absolutely for free. So thank you very much for your attention and we are getting back to the story. Algeria as an independent state emerged as a result of the War of Independence which lasted from 1954 to 1962. Until that time, since 1834, Algeria was a part of France. And during all this time, the French built something like a resource colony. Technically, the population of Algeria were considered as citizens of France, but their rights were lower than the native French. They could not take high positions, but at the same time, they were drafted into the army and used as labor. In addition, large reserves of gold, iron and wood were discovered in the country, all of which were used by the French. In short, everything that could be taken was taken to France. Or if it was possible to make something on the territory of Algeria, it was done there, but then it was also taken to France. So it was ordinary classic colony, when they took almost everything. And before the Second World War, it was come there. But after the war, cases began to appear when countries declared independence, for example from Britain. And the Algerians naturally wanted a normal free life. A serious national movement began to form in Algeria for the liberation of the country from France. The French, of course, sent an army, which resulted in a bloody and protracted war. And after some time, Algeria got an independence, but not completely. France signed the treaty with the condition that all control over all strategically important facilities and enterprises remained under the French control. Which means that after the signing of the agreement, the French, as before, will continue to export all the most valuable things beyond Algeria. Plus, part of the territory of Algeria in the Western Sahara was also needed by France, because the French used it to test nuclear weapons. Because at that time France already had nuclear weapons, and the testing of nuclear weapons is a very important part, since you can calculate anything on a computer, but in real life something can go wrong. And only after successful tests it can be declared that the country has weapons, because without this you won't be able to intimidate anyone, nobody will simply believe it. For example, five states now officially possess nuclear weapons. The USA, Russia, Great Britain, France and China. Presumably there are also nuclear weapons in North Korea, Israel, India and Pakistan. Presumably because all these countries have conducted tests, but no one knows whether they really have anything that really works. And at the same time, there are still explosions of nuclear bombs on our planet happening, which were carried out by no one at all. I want to say that the explosion was detected, but who did it? Nobody knows. No one admits who did it. <laughs> so it's a very sensitive topic for everyone, because nuclear weapons and capitalism are very successful means of pressure. And yeah, by the way, just in case anyone didn't know, nuclear weapons tests always involved animals, which were placed in different places to see the result later. Although we all know the case where test was conducted on humans. And it's not even North Korea. These were Americans. And we all know these test places. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yes, it's absolutely terrible, but who cares? Because that's the demonstration of power, what is necessary in modern politics. And since after the Second World War there was a redistribution of power in the world, a nuclear bomb in your pocket is a worthy argument. But at that moment France did not have nuclear weapons. And therefore it was the United States, Great Britain and the USSR who after the war decided how to share the spheres of influence. And after some time, after long discussions within, the French decided that they also needed their own atomic bomb. But the process of atomic bomb creation is a, roughly speaking quite difficult. 
<laughs> to begin with, you need a scientific base with laboratories and scientists, which in general was in France. But next, you need natural uranium and the large enrichment plant. And here we need to understand a little what enriched uranium is and how it's obtained. There is a natural uranium, which is mined from underground and where the uranium concentration in the ore is low, about 1% on average. That's why you need to dig some huge, super huge hole to dig out at least some needed quantity of uranium. Then you need to free this clean uranium from any dirt and straw. And finally, you would get a silver metal. You shouldn't touch it with the bare hands, but in ribbon gloves, it's okay. But in a such a form, it doesn't represent anything special. Yes, it's slightly radioactive and it's chemically active, but nothing more. But if you cast a certain magic on it, you can get something interesting. Regular uranium consists of three parts in strict proportions. Each part is called an isotope. Very roughly speaking, it's like a water consists of two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen. The uranium consists of three isotopes of uranium. Isotopes that make uranium are called like U-238, U-235 and U-234. Proportions of each isotope in uranium are different. U-238 takes the most of the mass, 99-27%, which is practically the whole amount of the element mass. And the rest takes a teeny tiny shear, the size of almost nothing. And essentially the basic mass with 99 and something percent is absolutely useless, because uranium-238 cannot do the nuclear chain reaction, which is a process when unstable nuclei of heavy atoms begin to crumble and emit neutrons which penetrate to neighboring nuclei and also cause them to collapse. And when a nucleus is destroyed, there is a release of energy happens. So when a chain reaction occurs and a large number of nuclei are destroyed, a huge release of energy occurs. And uranium-238, which occupies the bulk of uranium, cannot do this. But his brother, the U-235 isotope, can do the nuclear reaction and it does very well, by the way. But in uranium ore, there's only 0.72% of this active isotope. And you can't just pull it out because it's very active and will immediately react. And the third isotope, U-234, makes just 0.0005% of the basic mass, somewhere the level of acceptance error limit. That's why it's not even mentioned in many sources. And the most often you may face with information that uranium consists from isotopes U-238 and U-235, and that's it. And if we take the usual natural uranium in its usual natural condition, we couldn't gain anything in those proportions between the active isotope and the passive one. It's useless, because more than 99% of the mass doesn't want to do anything. But if you change that proportion and make uranium with a greater share of the active isotope, you might invent something interesting with it. And the process of the shear of active isotope increasing in the basic mass of uranium is called the uranium enrichment. And if finally you would be able to get this active isotope higher than the natural shear of 0.72% in the mass, then it would be enriched uranium. And that's it. It's pretty simple. Uranium enrichment is carried out by gigantic factories that consume enormous amounts of energy for their work. One such plant consumes as much energy as an entire city, therefore they're usually built next to some power plant so that this power plant works for one factory. And so, we pulled the uranium ore out of the ground, extracted uranium from it and brought it to a special uranium processing plant, spent a huge amount of energy on this and eventually obtained enriched uranium which can be used as a nuclear fuel. And there is one important point here. We need to understand how much we want to enrich uranium. If we raise the concentration of the isotope U-235 in uranium to 5, 10 or 20% of the total mass, then such enriched uranium can be used as a fuel in nuclear power plants. And if we increase its concentration to 90%, then it can already be used as a weapon. At the same time, they react as not for generating energy, but for various research, including the research of creation of weapons-grade uranium and plutonium. And for such reactors, enriched uranium of 5, 10 or 15% is just right. In fact, you can take a regular reactor for research, and from 5% uranium you can get some amount of weapons-grade uranium or plutonium. That's why everyone is very tense even because of the presence of conventional nuclear reactors in any country. These objects are usually secret and no one knows what exactly is happening there. Precisely because anything could happen there. But it's very difficult to obtain uranium with a 90% concentration of the 235 isotope. It's just incredibly difficult because this process is not linear. Each next stage of the circulation is more difficult and more expensive than the previous one. But after some time, scientists managed to find out that if you put 20% uranium into a nuclear reactor, then after some time you can remove plutonium from this reactor, which in a certain stage is ideal for nuclear weapons. And by the way, plutonium can only be obtained by this way, only inside a nuclear reactor, because it doesn't exist in nature. Plutonium is a man-made chemical element. Well, more precisely, it does exist in nature, but 
in such small volumes that it simply cannot be collected from it. And now you have plutonium. But we remember that you not only need to make a bomb, you also need to test it. And the Algeria was the ideal place for this. Just reminding that we're talking about Algeria here. And now you have a piece of desert with nobody living there, where you can blow up anything you want. You will not test nuclear weapons in the middle of France, right? And that's what they did. In total, France conducted 17 nuclear weapons tests in Algeria from 1960 to 1966. First tests were simply land-based, that's they exploded nuclear weapons on the ground. And just later they began to do underground tests. Underground testing is when a bomb is placed into a deep shaft and exploded there to not pollute everything around with radioactive ash. And after Algeria, the French went to test weapons in French Polynesia, which was also another colony of France. But the question is why I'm telling you all this? In this whole nuclear testing story, there is one person who is very interesting to us. This man's name is Michel Baron, who was a diplomat and intelligence officer in France, and who was directly involved in discussions of important issues in Algeria. Generally, he was engaged in protecting interests of France throughout Africa. And this beautiful formulation, like protecting the interests of the country, which we may often hear from officials, is translated into human language as stealing factories, establishing and maintaining control of some important industry sectors, installing people in some important positions in the government, and something like this. And the fact that after the Algeria independence acknowledgement, all important objects remained under the control of France is precisely what is called protection of interests in the language of diplomats. And this is pretty much what Michel had been doing since 1950s. But in some day he receives a call from the French government, where he was informed that he need immediately fly to Gabon. For what? Because a uranium mine was found there, with such uranium reserves that they could cover almost the entire planet. As you may guess from all said above, everything related to uranium and its enrichment is a very sensitive and important topic. But France did not have its own uranium in sufficient quantities, because this is quite rare and unique element on our planet. Therefore, France mostly mined uranium on the territory of its colonies, since the country's entire nuclear program depended on it. That was so important that a special department was established in France, something like the Nuclear Energy Commission, which essentially consisted of scientists and intelligence agents. These guys traveled to absolutely all the colonies of France and tried to find at least some traces of uranium there. And in 1956, somewhere in Gabon, they stumbled upon a very strange place. Gabon at that time was a small African country and completely under the control of France, which exported coffee, timber, minerals and almost everything from there. And the place that the French stumbled upon was strange because the uranium that was contained in this deposit had not usual proportions. Do you remember that uranium is divided into isotopes and the ratio of isotopes in the total mass of uranium is strictly defined? So in the uranium that was found in Gabon, the concentration of the active isotope U-235 was 0.717%. And the difference seems to be small, but the fact is that no one had ever seen this before. Uranium has always been in certain proportions. No more, no less. And there was less active isotope than usual. And just later, scientists found out that in this place, two billion years ago, there was a rare natural nuclear reactor, which burned out the part of the active uranium. But this wasn't yet known and actually didn't bother everyone much. Because the most important thing is that the French needed uranium. And they got it. Over the next 17 years, the French will dig five huge uranium mines in this territory which will bring Gabon to sixth place in the world in uranium production. And now look, imagine that you are the French government at the moment when this deposit was discovered. Well, you have already signed all the papers on the independence of your colonies. So what would you do being on their side? Absolutely correct. You will put your own completely controlled government in Gabon. And this is exactly what Michel Baron did. Please welcome Leon Mba and Albert Bernard Bongo. These guys were not only friends, they also were the first and the second presidents of the Republic of Gabon. But at that time, Leon was just an ordinary politician, but with a kind of pro-French way of thinking. He even tried to be elected to the National Assembly of France in 1951. And Michel Baron said to Leon that France can give Gabon an independence and make Leon the first president of the Republic, but only with one condition. The control of important deposits in Gabon belongs to France. Leon agreed, and naturally right after this, there was created the Democratic Party of Gabon, because everything should look like democracy. For several years, there was made the desired image for Leon Mba, and then he was appointed to the position of the President and Executive Council of Gabon. Independence was declared on August 17, 
1960, and at this moment Leon Ba automatically becomes the head of the government. But the country now is independent, plus democracy has arrived. So it is time to hold real, free and democratic presidential elections. Because the signing of all documents took place under the slogans for the sake of people, for the freedom, for the future. So, with undisgust and open joy, I ask you to meet yourself with a list of presidential candidates, that you could feel the intensity of this competitive struggle. So here's the list. And we're not joking, there's only one candidate. And amazingly, he got 100% of the votes. Apparently, he was a great candidate. Naturally, everyone understood perfectly well that Leon would simply follow instructions from Paris. Therefore, the opposition tried to stage a coup in 1967, and they were even able to kidnap the president. But Charles de Gaulle said he would resolve the issue, and within 24 hours, the French transferred their military and special forces from the Republic of Congo, where they were also engaged in democratic issues. They quickly found the president, returned him to the place, and left. But unfortunately, after some time, Leon died and the new president was needed. And the best candidate this time was his friend, Albert Bongo, who was made the president in exactly the same way as Leon Ba was made before. And he was also elected on the basis of fair democratic elections with just one candidate on the list. And all this happened naturally under the control of Michel Barron, because he was responsible for the African region. But let's return to the uranium mines. By that time, there were already four large holes in which uranium was mined. But extracting uranium is only a part of the problem because it needs to be delivered to an enrichment plant in France. How to deliver uranium from the mining site? Because you need to understand that Gabon in the 60s was approximately 240,000 square kilometers of absolutely nothing, just jungle land and mountains. So along the river will not work, it's shallow. By plane, it's very expensive. Build a uranium enrichment plant in Gabon? It's an even bigger problem. The only way is to transport it to the port by rail and from there take it to the France by the ship. It only needs to understand who will pay for the construction of the railway. Because building a 700 km long railway in such conditions is also very expensive. Because at that time there was no any infrastructure in Gabon. It would have to be built from scratch. And the French naturally didn't want to spend a lot of money on the railway in another country. Moreover, this would raise many questions. Why did the French suddenly decide to do this? and no one wanted to attract attention. It was decided that the president of Gabon would ask himself to allocate the funds necessary for the construction of the railway, because the country needs to develop and needs infrastructure. But no one gave him a loan, and finally in 1973 Michel Barron came to Albert Bongo and said something like, no worries, I agreed on everything. We have sponsors who are ready to build everything. There is only one condition. You need to convert to Islam. And it's not a joke, there was such a conversation. But the whole point was, that all this time the French had been conducting secret negotiations with the APEC countries, for which these negotiations were also very beneficial. Because 1973 is the year of oil crisis. Arab countries wanted to get some respect and wanted to be taken seriously, so they imposed restrictions on oil supplies. But the fact is that you can impose such restrictions once or twice, but you will not be able to blackmail countries that have nuclear weapons for a long time. And you only have few Kalashnikovs and a couple of missiles. The APEC countries also wanted to get their own nuclear weapons, and the French could help them with this. That is why, by the way, France received oil at the crisis time without any additional markups. And in order not to attract attention, France also tried to save fuel, pretending there was a lack of it. But there was no need for this. In 1968, the UN committee created a treaty on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, which obliged all countries with nuclear weapons not to transfer this technology to anyone. The agreement was signed by the United States, Great Britain and the USSR. But the France did not sign the agreement. The French decided to play their own game and legally had no restrictions for this. Michel Barron came up with the perfect scheme. The essence of the deal was this. First, APEC countries give the money to build a railway in Gabon from the uranium mines to the port. Second, France is responsible for the uranium delivery with all safety measures. Third, young specialists from APEC countries will undergo trainings at universities in France. Fourth, with money from APEC countries, France is building a uranium enrichment plant, which will be 10% owned by APEC countries and which will receive 10% of all enriched uranium. And fifth, France will supply APEC countries with several nuclear reactors and help to launch them. This is the whole scheme. Albert Bongo needed to convert to Islam just to confirm the seriousness of this deal. The only problem is that this deal was not entirely with APEC. 
Yes, APEC participated as organization, but all negotiations and conditions were discussed with just one specific country. And this country was Iran. Iran was one of the countries that initiated the APEC creation. Because in the 70s, Iran is one of the most developed countries in the Middle East. Iran actively sold oil and invested money in its own economy. Most likely, Iran could independently develop nuclear weapons, but it would take a long time and probably other countries would interfere with this, because no one needed another center of power. But there was a possibility to come to an agreement with the French. And apparently, it was also beneficial for the French. Therefore, in 1973, Albert Bonga converted to Islam as a confirmation of his intentions. And in the same year, construction of the railway had begun in Gabon. At the same time, two companies were created. The French government created the Kagima Company, and the Iranian government created the Safidiv. These two companies exchanged each other's shares in certain proportions and jointly created a third company, which was called Euradiv, in which was supposed to own the uranium enrichment plant in France. All this had to be done so that Iran would ultimately receive 10% of the uranium, according to the agreement. For this, the Shah of Iran, Mohammad Reza Pehlevi, paid France $1.18 billion for the construction of this plant. And the French were supposed to supply nuclear reactors and enriched uranium fuel. Everything looked like the construction of an ordinary nuclear power plant for the production of electricity, so that no one would guess. According to the agreement, the uranium enrichment plan was to be launched in 1978, as was the railway. And the last payment from Iran was supposed to arrive in 1978 as well, which the Iranian government did. By this time, France had already delivered several nuclear reactors to Iran. And as soon as the Euradiv plant was completed, shipments of enriched uranium were to be sent to Iran. But the point is that no one was going to supply any uranium. In 1977, at the moment when Iran paid for everything, the Islamic Revolution began in the country. People did not like to rapid transition to the Western way of life. And generally, Iran had enough strength to take the situation under control, but the French managed to bring Imam Khamenei, who was the leader of the protests, to some secret place in Paris. And they didn't even hide it. It was presented as if the French were saving a fighter for the freedom and the bright future for Iran. Although the French perfectly well understood that this is a good opportunity to get the money and not fulfill their obligations. Plus the Americans, who after the oil crisis dreamed of taking their revenge on Iran. As a result, the revolution ended in victory. We will not judge whether this is good or bad. For us, there is something else which is important. The important thing is that when Ayatollah Khamenei came to power and plunged into what happened before him, he realized that his country had been cheated with a nuclear deal. Another fair question from Iran, where is their uranium? Immediately from all the media towards Iran flew accusations that this is a terrible country that is going to create nuclear weapons to threaten the whole world. Therefore, we all must unite against these terrible people. At the same time, and immediately after the Islamic Revolution, the war between Iran and Iraq begins, where other countries also participated. Since Iran was a strong state and could become one of the centers of power in the near future, other countries could not allow this to happen. Therefore, the USA, Great Britain, France and the USSR sponsored Iraq in this war. And it turns out that Iran not only lost the money and was then openly sent to hell with all the agreements, but also got a war. Although the Iranian government even tried to file complaints in the world courts against the nuclear deal with the French, confirming everything with documents. They asked to return their money, but in response, they just received blocking of accounts and additional sanctions. So what would you do in the place of the Iranian government? In the situation where everything is against you and you cannot prove anything, having all the documents in your hands, you will take revenge. And since there are no rules, the revenge will be cruel. Iran begins to sponsor radical organizations within France, and thus begins its plan for revenge. In this sense, they definitely were great professionals. Those guys were responsible for about 120 human victims. There was some serious level of support. Yes, the weapons supply, training and transfer of necessary information were under the control and supervision of Iran's intelligence services. And this is the answer to where a regular organization gets training of professional mercenaries. The amazing thing is that they made 80 raids and were never caught. Some actions of the Exxon Direct organization were carried out simply to distract the attention, such as an attack on a police station, and some actions were carried out exactly on targets. The first victim is René Adran. The murder happened in 1986. Do you really care who is fighting there on the other side of the planet? René Adran was engaged in weapons supply to Iraq, the enemy of Iran, and the particular cruelty with which he was killed shocked the French leadership. February 1986, a bomb exploded in one of the stores of the retail chain, 
that belonged to Michel Barron. It looked like an ordinary terrorist attack, but Michel knew why this bomb ended up in his store. He was engaged in protecting interests of France throughout Africa. Two months later, a known people right in the center of Paris hit by a car a 22-year-old girl named Veronica to death. Veronica's last name was Baron. You will take revenge. September 1986, another store in Renault Pub had been exploded. This is an ordinary bar where factory workers hang out. And if the bomb in the store was addressed to Michel Baron again, so the bomb in the Renault Pub was addressed to some other person. It was addressed to the person who participated in the deal with Iran not less than Michel Baron. It was addressed to the person that was building that uranium enrichment plant, Eurodiv, and who was its CEO, to George Bess. Why did somebody want to kill the head of the car manufacturer? Why was particularly George Bess killed? The operation was planned specifically against him. George Bess was involved in nuclear development before joining Renault. He was the CEO of Kagima. This is the company through which Iran paid $1 billion. And 20 minutes later, even the mayor of Paris arrived, who was then Jacques Chirac and who in the future would become the prime minister of France. Jacques Chirac, George Bess and Michel Baron had been friends since their university. In 1974, Chirac being the prime minister and with the president of France, they signed the deal with Iran. And when you need to run such a dangerous deal, you would put on main positions only your closest people, people you may trust with your life. And when one of your best friends is killed and another one has lost his daughter, you understand that you're next. On the night after the murder of George Bess, Jacques Chirac had a telephone conversation with the president of France. And the next day, France announced that it would transfer the first payment in the amount of $330 million, returning the money that was paid for Eurodiv plant. But it was not the whole amount, only third. That is why, February 5th, 1987, the plane crashed in Gabon. It was a private plane of Michel Baron. He died, as well as the entire crew. You will take revenge. And since there are no rules, the revenge will be cruel. After all that, when all people who took part in this scheme paid their price, each their own, when France announced that yes, okay, we're ready to give the money back, after that it's time to safely give up the gunman, as a goodwill gesture for negotiations. Why did such a powerful organization almost voluntarily cease to exit immediately after this murder? On February 21st, 1987, 16 days after the plane crash and the death of Michel Baron, the French police referring to some inside sources found the leaders of Axion direct on a farm in the suburbs of Paris. And they surrendered without a fight. Those gunmen who fought so fiercely against the government, against the order, against capitalism, they just fulfilled the task. George Bess was killed because of the nuclear deal, where the French played the fool with absolutely everyone in it. And all talks about the fight for equality was just a cover. Of course, this is a theory. There is also an opinion that George Bass was killed because of his work at Renault. In order to punish this capitalist for taking money from the workers of France and investing it in the American company, the French decided to buy a local company which turned out to be the American Motor Company or AMC. AMC together with Renault developed a crossover which they managed to release during George Bass's lifetime. And the name of this crossover is Jeep Cherokee, the car that became a bestseller on the American market and on the basis of which the Grand Cherokee was created a little later which has become a super popular car not only in the USA, but throughout the world. But the fruits of these developments did not go to Renault, did not go to France, since Raymond Levy, who replaced George Bass, was simply afraid that he would also be killed and did not continue the project. He ended up selling AMC to Chrysler and already Chrysler, the new star of the company, Lee Coca, will tell everyone with a smile in commercials what a wonderful car it is and a true symbol of America. And he will sell this car all over the planet and Renault which had spent millions of dollars to keep AMC afloat, should have simply relaxed and profited from the American market. But four bullets fired at the CEO of the plant supposedly for the sake of the people of France will deprive the very people of France of all the profits, for the sake of which all this was started. And activists, under the banner of the fight against capitalism, made an incredible gift to this capitalism, just in another country. Of course, development of the humanity cannot be denied. And for a thousand years, people fought less and less. The value of human life has increased noticeably. But unfortunately, the modern capitalist system continues to force people to chase money. And very often, there are no rules in this race. <laughs>